everybody, and welcome again to Table Takes. I am glad you're all here. Guess what? We have a bu- 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 character change out, and we have a new special guest joining us today. You might have uh, uh, seen him on our, of course, spring special, and it is Noir. Hello, hello. How, f- how have you been doing this week? And welcome to Table Takes. Am I am I not Derek? What happened? <laughs> they <laughs> recast Derek. They recast it. It's a whole. I- <laughs> oh man, he's, he's gonna beat me up if he sees it. No, hey everybody, yeah, I'm the art. I'm very glad to be here. <laughs> yeah, no, is thank you for for joining us. But yeah, what well, like so in the beginning, of course, we yes, we like yes. to tell ask people how was your week. You know, let's let's bring in the news. Yeah, we have to talk about news. But how are you doing? How are you doing? Me, I'm I'm doing all right. Uh, I'm gearing up for Gary Khan. Uh, I have a I have a one shot to run with my Into the Southlands crew, which includes Jin Khan's very own Marcus, who plays the most shredded cat you know. They're gonna be playing <laughs> level twenty characters. Uh, I've had a pretty productive week. Uh, I've put together a new resume, getting all my information uh, for games I've run and stuff, so that uh, people might want to have me around some more. Oh, it's exciting! Yeah. It is very exciting. Uh, <laughs> but uh, and 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 then yeah, just more exciting news. Yeah, hint hint, cough cough, kind of thing. But also, <laughs> also, Emma, what have you been up to? Oh, have you also been having a productive week? Mm, uh, it's just <laughs> like spending money, <laughs> buying stuff. Uh, I broke down just dice. It's just all dice all the way down, oh, and nice. kickstarters. Just buying dice, buying Kickstarters, Dice Envy, which is this company that I get emails from, which I shouldn't. Gosh, yes, they come right into my email and it's a picture (laughs) of dice. And I'm like, I shouldn't do this to myself because I'm gonna buy them. Uh, They had the the Spice Must Flow, the desert dice, just a couple of days ago. And they're like a metal uh, with a shine on them. So one way they're like purple shiny and another way they're orange shiny. So very, very nice dice. Orange. Um, I like orange. Yeah. And I also have just been, <laughs> you, you should check them out. The, the, the new dice envy dice. I think you would like them. They're in your style. No, no, I, I, w- I would say that you weren't just spending money. You were uh, contributing uh, to the, the, m- m- the economy yeah uh this week mm-hmm. there you go I, tra- tra- contributing to the economy. i'm carrying the dice economy <laughs> my my shoulders and my capitalism needs those go-go bucks <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yeah but yeah now of course isabella what have you been doing stunningly this week huh anything um, uh no <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> All no, right. I've been, um, uh, this has been, I've had so, I have so many deadlines uh, to, to me and I haven't been doing any of them. I've been following uh, pop culture, which has been terrible. I woke up uh, super early this morning to try to get um, some he- Hello Kitty Amiibo cards for my, for my Animal Crossings. Um, and Mr. Target Man uh, spit in my face. Um, so that didn't work out. Um, and then I stood up last night. I watched The Falcon and the Winter Soldier, which was super, super great. Um, I have watched a ton of movies this week. Um, I've done everything except for productivity, except for the things that I was supposed to do. Um, and I have, um, I have gout now. I have GERT. Uh, because I'm I'm so anxious from all of my looming deadlines and the productivity and the oh, acid no. is is rising mm. up um, oh. in my throat. So yeah. Um, uh, also, um, there's um, uh, yes. <laughs> I, I feel like <laughs> rewording is that you took time to treat yourself this week before yeah. a big headline. There you go. Yeah. There. I, Positive I, spins. Positive I love spins. you. But this is- <laughs> This was this was self harm. This, oh, no. <laughs> this was totally. Well, I, I I didn't do anything. I have so many deadlines like coming up, and uh, for the for did y'all know that it's almost April? Um, I can't. Uh, I can't. <laughs> no, oh, yeah, time no, no, time no, exists. No, no, no. I, just, yeah, I hate it. Um, I mean, and I have my so only many question. deadlines for for the first of April, and so um, yes, I have not been doing any of them. 
Uh, but I have been consuming a lot of pop culture. If you want to follow me on Twitter, that's all I've been talking about. Talk to me about the Lil Nas X video. I cannot get it out of my head. Uh, if you want to talk to me about K-pop, if you want to talk to me about Falcon and the Winter Soldier, that's all I want to talk about. But also if you want to cyber bully me and remind me that I have <laughs> deadlines that are coming up immediately. No, oh, no. Oh, Please uh, bully uh, me. <laughs> Is, were you watching good movies at least? That's my class. Yeah, I watched like, what, what, called uh, "The Devil All the Time," which I highly, highly recommend. Uh, okay. Is, um, Tom Holland, Robert Pattinson, and Sebastian. Oh, Stanley. that's the one where they have the weird Southern accents. They, oh. they do have Southern accents. Oh my god! <laughs> it's, it's it's very good. It's very it's a very good. Movie. <laughs> <laughs> I have thoughts and I'm gonna keep them to myself. Oh. <laughs> to yourself. <laughs> okay, we could expose ourselves. In any case, it's all right. Don't feel bad as well. I I just basically didn't sleep this week, and it was great. No, it wasn't. It wasn't. It was great. No, uh, but it's okay because now I have uh, a story of the season, all of P- Pioneer Town, and now I can virtually pretend that I'm a very successful and productive person on my Switch. Yay! <laughs> Oh gosh, I gotta check that out. I don't know if that it's is. It's a good game. They got really fat animals uh, that that you could love. If you were into oh, the round boys, you'll love them. Oh, the round boys. Uh, okay. But we're gonna go ahead and jump into these little headlines. We're gonna take all of our little bits of happiness and maybe put it in our pocket, like other things that are happening this week, like a game, you like can a game. fit a whole game into your pocket. Specifically, if it fits onto a business card. This week, uh, for the last couple of days, there's been a business card game jam. Uh, the Pleasure Not Business Card RPG Jam prioritizes, prioritizes pocket size play. Wow, that's a tongue twister. The jam's looking for tabletop games convinced to sit to fit on a single printed card, regular standard business card, which is kind of fascinating because like, we're not doing business cards anymore. Oh, yeah. It used to be such a thing, right? I, I actually run out, ran out of business cards last year. I'm like, oh, I got to reprint my business cards. Then I didn't. And that was great because I have not at all needed them for a very long year. Uh, so for this jam, there's already 200 submitted. And most of them are free to pay, uh, free to play or pay what you want. So if you go and check out this link, you can see all these great games. It ends March 30th. Uh, basically designed to be just a one page RPG. I actually kind of, I want to print out other people's games or have someone print them out and like ship them or ship a box of them or something. Cause I want them on the nice business card stuff. You know, it's kind of hard to print that on my home printer. I'm like, I just want to get like two, all 200 in a box and just have them sent to me. I I would pay some some bucks for that. Uh, of all the games, I've looked at a few of the games, but I actually heard about this business card game jam because one of my favorite designers, Jian Shim, posted a design for a business card game that is the best. I'm not going to look at all of them. I'm just going to arbitrarily say that because you fold it and you make a little tent and your person, your imaginary person lives in there and they've they've run away from society due to some shame and you have to build them things around their business card tent so that you can uh, help them to recover uh, recover themselves from these horrible things that have happened. And it is so, it punched me right in the heart when I read the description of it. Uh, so you just, we have a link for that in the chat. You should check that out. There's also other cool games like uh, uh, Tam- Tamagotchi Pet One where you procedurally play this game for a couple of minutes a day and raise your Tamagotchi <laughs> pet. So uh, I love things, jams like this, especially because just the ideas that people come up with are absolutely wild. So it's just a fun, happy thing that happened this week. And I like it. Yeah, no, it's just nice little like concise things. Even uh, like w- before we were talking about this uh, uh, when we were doing like, or before streams and, and Noir, you had something to say like about Emma's description of one of the games. <laughs> it, it, it's so peaceful that you just reading out the instructions made me resolve some internal issues that I was <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, Truly. maybe it's not so bad. Like, <laughs> Oh, Emma, oh, Emma God. has a it has a healing. <laughs> Emma and I have actually never met in person, but <laughs> Emma has a healing effect on you. It's just <laughs> so wholesome, so wholesome. Yes, 
Thank you. It's the only time I've heard a dollar bill referenced and didn't freak out about the fact that I have no dollar bills in my possession. (laughs) (laughs) Fair, fair. Fair. It's okay. It's, we got we to gotta upgrade to like the cool Canadian money that you can throw in the oven anyways, you know? That's the you cooler. The oven? <laughs> yeah. yeah, you could throw like, I, I saw a video of people. With, I watched the internet. <laughs> enough. Bonsai, Bonsai, did you it. also see the video where you can dry your phone in the microwave? <laughs> I was then... just about to say that. <laughs> <laughs> Are you saying the internet lies to me, Emma? Why? Oh, you no. mean the iPhone <laughs> wave? Yeah, we all yeah. know about yeah, charging right your in the phone. Microwave. Oh, charging it. That's what it was. Yeah, you charge yeah. it in the microwave. The bag of rice say. actually does work. So just, just letting you know, rice cures a lot of things. <laughs> If anybody needed to know that it is true. I was like, Buzz, like, please, not everything on the internet is real. <laughs> you mean I somebody would just go to the internet <laughs> and tell lies? Hmm. I need I need the sources on this Canadian money can be cooked in the oven. I think there are there are Canadians disputing <laughs> this in the chat. So <laughs> I was just in belief. So I was in belief that your money was uber strong. But okay, I guess I was wrong. I guess <laughs> take it back. All right, so um, next story. <laughs> yeah. All right, but yeah, no, okay. So let's go ahead and we wanted to get some laughs in because we have some uh, like really serious things to dive into a really, not really quick. This is something that we're going to have a long discussion about. So uh, for uh, anyone's information of what has been going on this week in uh, RPG news, um, basically... Uh, POC Gamer, uh, also known as Pazer Lion and uh, Graham, or how, I, I think I got this, uh, Barber, is that how you pronounce their, mm-hmm. their name? Uh, they basically called out Watsi for what they basically did with, of course, the new uh, uh, source book that they're coming out with and calling out the problems with the supplement of Candle uh, Keep Mysteries. Uh, after problematic uh, changes have been submitted to his material. Uh, You will go ahead and post the link of connecting all of the stuff that's uh, behind it and what the complaints are about it. Uh, I'm going to just give a brief uh, description of what is going on, but I highly recommend that you read this because there are like several posts uh, just going on about like, hey, this is the problems that we're having. Uh, There's really, uh, to sum it up, three real broad, uh, like, three issues, three very main issues. Uh, first, the editor's cut, uh, like basically cut uh, the his like 6,000 or 6,969 uh, words, like basically cut a, like 1,300 words from the final draft. They uh, did this after making the changes and in the initial feedback. Uh, he like basically the understanding between the writer and the editor was that Uh, they would be doing a back and forth. And uh, what they thought they submitted as a final draft uh, was not actually, and they did not inform the creator of all the changes that they made. Um, And thus, you know, he went on promoting all of the stuff that he thought was still inside the book for their advertisement and everything, uh, not knowing how much changes they actually made. Uh, secondly, he hoped to use the adventure to contribute to the Forgotten Realms lore and deepen the lore. All of that uh, that they put as a way to make the lore richer uh, was cut and was not made clear to the creator. Like I said, this is just a very big lack of communication. Uh, lastly, but which is the most important part that we have to uh, address is that uh, so POC Gamer purposely changed a lot of the language that uh, he uses in this to step away from uh, colonious overtones. Uh, this is something that even Watsi stated that we're going to try to change in our company. Uh, we are going to make strives to do this and to see for like that basically they say that, but when it was time for them to make, you know, make word on what they said, uh, they ended up discrediting or like basically throwing out all this like alternative language that uh, that POC Gamer was trying to use uh, and then just put back those old colonialist overtones of like, you know, discuss like telling folks like, for example, the frog folk uh, was they they they're trying to make it so it, it wasn't and the language wasn't just necessarily 
bad, uh, but reverting to the calling them primitive and basic, like essentially taking away the characters, uh, like the culture and character that he created of these frog folks, the uh, Gripplies, uh, and also the Yontis, which of course are uh, in uh, Forgotten Realms, the big baddie. Uh, they tried to, uh, like P PC Gamer tried to take away that whole like evil for the evil sake, which again, Watsi was saying that we uh, want to step away from the fact that things aren't just inherently evil because of their uh, like, you know, race. And uh, it's, it's, it's very sad, at least for me to see that, you know, they, they say this, but then their actions, at least, this is just my opinion, their actions are not reflecting uh, the words that they say. And this is what I feel is very problematic. Uh, anybody else want to go ahead and like add on <laughs> to that point? Yeah, uh, yeah, it, it just uh, there, there have been a couple of threads about the follow up from Wizards not being uh, the best. Um, uh, that they, they haven't, to my knowledge, directly responded to this. Rather, they've been touting the rest of their POC writers going, uh, Hey, we can't be. I mean, I'm not not putting words in their mouth, but mm. the, uh, a, 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 the 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 actions um, allude to. Hey, we can't be that bad. Look how uh, look how other many PLCs we have, and it's just um, hiring PLC people is great. That's that's like half of the job. Um, letting giving them the opportunities and the space that they need to be successful, that's the rest of the job. Uh, and that is what I personally feel like they're failing at. Uh, and it's not something that they can't do. Um, if this were a Matt Mercer, if this were a Pat Rothfuss, I have no doubts that the editor's edits would be in that person's inbox. So why is it in his inbox? Why is he promoting a work that doesn't exist because Wizard decided that it doesn't get to exist? That's the thing that's upsetting. You don't get to have the photo op unless you do the work. And I think that that's something that needs to be established. But that, yeah. that's just my two cents. <laughs> yeah, I think that one of the, the things that um, I found particularly disturbing about this, one is uh, that number count of which they cut, that's a huge amount of material to cut um, without letting the original author know that, that you cut that. That is really a huge oversight on the editor's uh, fault to not go back to that person and say, listen, we need to cut. This is, this is the minimum that we need to have or the maximum that we need to have and we need to cut this and work together with that person. That's just a respect thing that you need to have for the creator. Secondly, this person went on like a, a press tour. They spoke to people about their work, not knowing that their work had been significantly altered. And that's humiliating for a creator. Um, and that's also going back to a respect thing. And also this whole, this whole project was supposed to be about sh showing that there was more of an initiative on Watsi's part to be more inclusive and to be more mindful. And that's how Watsi marketed it to mm -hmm. people was that it was this way of empowering more creators, more creators of color. But then to find out on the back end of it, that's actually not really what happened. And I think that for a lot of creators of color, for a lot of marginalized communities, this is very familiar. This is a normal thing that happens uh, where we are sort of like put out in front, um, used for diversity clout, but then behind the scenes, we are disempowered. Um, and. I feel like this is an ongoing conversation of my ever growing disappointment with Watsi of like having an opportunity and not and failing that opportunity. And it just feels like y'all cannot, why can't y'all, this, this was a slam dunk, why, yeah. why? And I just, I feel really for the, the content creator um, for, for having their work um, taken a, a away from them in a way that made them I'm sorry, did you guys hear that? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> that's 
my my cat loves the door stopper. Oh, oh, the- oh, oh, oh I, thought, I thought you just ripped a big one. I was just not. Oh my say god! I, I'm oh. sorry. I'm sorry. I saw it on your face what you thought it was, and I was just like, I'm gonna keep it quiet. I would keep it cute. I would, I would never. <laughs> oh my god! No, I'm oh, sorry. Never. Sorry, not to digest from the serious subject. Sorry. <laughs> so, no, I w- also I would never fart on stream. Um, I would I would mute and then I would fart just for the record. Um, no, I'm sorry. My cat's favorite toy is the door stopper. Um, anyway, so yes, that's that's how I feel about about that. Um, this is my fear as as a writer of mm. games is to have this happen to me. It's just okay. it's so disrespectful. And the last thing that I, I just want to just hop in on is we've got to make sure that we hold them accountable and that our memory is long. If you if you're just getting into this and you see this, I can see how it might not seem like that big of a deal. But when you take this and you remember Orion, who had a laundry list of yeah. terrible experiences with Watsis, with Watsi, then you you can take a look at what PLC Gamer is saying and validate it against what Orion was complaining about. This is not a one-time incident. This is systemic, and this is something that would not happen to a Matt Mercer. This is something that would not happen to a pack, uh, to to any to anybody else with clout. This mm-hmm. is clearly something that's happening. Because, because of how Watsi values freelance PLC writers. They're lucky to be in the door. They're lucky to be able to put Watsi on their resume. So they should shut, shut up. And we can't let that be the standard. Yeah. And just like you said, they, they cut something like a quarter of the work. And they cut the voice they, there's the way that POC Gamer is putting it is that it's not as good anymore. It's like you hire someone for their talent, for their unique perspective. And that's what people want. That's the quality. And so people are, people will conflate these things. They'll say, they'll look at this like, oh, well, this person isn't as good of a writer or whatever. And that's like, that's awful, you know, for to put them in front of people and then to take their power away. That's you're, giving them exposure in, in a bad way, right? And now people will doubt their work and it was all like great to start out with. <laughs> and, and then they have to defend themselves, right? It's like, well, that wasn't what I did. And it's just, uh, it's very frustrating. <laughs> yeah, it, it's just a very huge lack of communication on this part and kind of some things that need to be questioned whether or not these processes are handled fair And especially if you want more folks, of course, from like all very different types of ethnicities and representations of culture, like this is a sign. Are we going to be respected if we uh, give you our like little project baby, you know, and we'll still have uh, yet to see if there is going to be more changes, but I really do want to make people aware this is what's going on right now. Please click on the various articles and then also help us by lending your voice and calling out when these instances happen. Uh, on, on that note, we're gonna go ahead and give you more examples of, hey, you know what? Uh, especially in this, of course, stop all hate, like start stop the hate against Asians. We have another thing that just popped up in the gaming community that should have been caught beforehand, but yes. didn't. And now we're seeing how people are acting. Noir, please tell us. Yes. So Legendary Games uh, has apologized for horrifically tone-deaf Asian uh, spell compendium. Um, they, they they had a spell compendium that included some really outdated and racially tinged language. And uh, uh, HDT Paladin called it out. Um, now, to... To legendary games credit, they have gone forward and um, they, you know, they've pulled, they've pulled the project. Um, they've taken down all the material that was pop- problematic. They've apologized uh, and gave a list of reasons in detail as to how the material was problematic, and they've delayed upcoming pro- uh, products for cultural review. So those are good, healthy steps to fix the problem. But I, I wanted to talk about the problem uh, just because uh, to me, this is a this is another symptom of the same problem. 
which is uh, for our previous story, the problem was there are PLC in the room, but they're being silenced. In this case, it does not appear that there were PLC in the room. Um, you can you can look up the article and see some of the language that was used. It's it's not awesome, um, especially right now. Um, the Asian community is facing. Uh, I I wish I could say an unprecedented raise a rise and violence in their community, but it's not unprecedented. It's, it's as American as apple pie and it's, it's gotta stop. And every, every little bit of this kind of ick, every, every, every thoughtless, every thoughtless word that is put into text that is supposed to be legitimized in our scene that adds to the violence that the Asian community is facing. And we've got to be more thoughtful. We've got to slow ourselves down. We've got to slow down our projects, our profits, our production, and we've got to start thinking about people. Um, and that means making sure that if you're working on a project that does hold anything about the Asian community, you've got to have them present in the room. Nobody can speak to their experiences the way that they can. Nobody can tell you what is harmful to them like they can. And going forward with them absent is dangerous, especially right now. So that's my I mean, <laughs> I, think, I think that you know, well, they lost me as soon as they started talking about inspired by the mysteries of the Orient. I was mm. immediately oh. <laughs> like, I was like, all right, well, yeah. close this window. Um, I, I don't, it could not have happened at a worse time. It could yeah. not like in the culture and the zeitgeist uh, for this to, to happen. But this is, this is goes back to what we were just talking about. This is what happens when you don't have people, people of color behind the scenes um, I understand that they released a list of the things that they've done wrong and they, this sort of recognition of their mistakes. But if you had had people of color, uh, particularly Asian people who are empowered enough uh, in, your, in your organization to be able to speak up to this, it wouldn't have been an issue in the first place. And it's not like these people just woke up in 2021 uh, with this idea that maybe this is not, this is not news. None of this is news. We on Table Tags report on this stuff once a month, once a month, this, least, something like this yeah, happens. At least, at the very it's, least. <laughs> so it's not news. And I'm, I'm tired of like being like, oh, well, you know, we can only, you can only know, you can only grow if you know. I'm, I'm so over that. Nobody gets a pass anymore. Not in 2021. Mm. You should know. I mean, and honestly, so. shout out to HTT Paladin for calling this out, but also he shouldn't have to do that work. <laughs> You know, mm -hmm. uh, having something like that come across your timeline, it sucks. Uh, mm. I've, I've, I, I'm sure that every them presenting or PLC person has had their DMs filled with ugh. You don't also need your timeline to be filled with ugh. So let's all help each other out and take an extra second to make sure Am I being a problem? <laughs> if you find out that you are being a problem, find somebody and compensate them so that they can guide you to the solution. Yeah. All right. Yeah. No, that's just repeat, echo that call. Hey, look at yourself before you do anything and be like, hey, let me get a second opinion about this. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. Am I the help. baddie? Yes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> are we the baddies? Are we the baddies? <laughs> More shoddy, yeah. All right. Um, More shoddy, so, don't miss. Yeah. All right. So we do also want, to, as this rolling theme is going on, we also want to go ahead and talk about one more aspect of that. Hey, like this is recognized that we got problems, and Isabella, please tell I'm us so about. Sorry. I I, yeah. I deeply apologize for more more bad news, but I have something cool coming up after this. I yeah, promise. after this, don't worry. So one more, one more, <laughs> one, one more, more. <laughs> one <Okay>. more spoonful. <laughs> uh, Spencer Campbell, who is an indie designer uh, behind the game Warframe, uh, behind the Warframe inspired RPG frame, 
canceled his latest project due to online harassment and toxicity. Um, this was really interesting to me uh, because of the fact that this is kind of an ongoing conversation in the community about homages to previous games and the line that exists between an homage and plagiarism, quote unquote. So Spencer Campbell is an indie designer who had previously designed a TTRPG called Light, which was inspired by the game Destiny. This is his other project, his next project after that, which is called Frame, which is inspired by Warframe. Um, the community, when it was released online, um, in there was a Reddit that it was released on to. Uh, there were some complaints about it on the Reddit, uh, of which uh, Campbell responded to immediately as, as far as being like, you know, he didn't really like the response to the release that was happening onto the Reddit post. And apparently when he launched the Kickstarter, that was when the campaign of harassment happened to him over Twitter, Reddit and Discord. So he canceled the game completely over um, accusations that he was being, um, that he was plagiarizing the original um, IP of which, you know, I think that, that for me personally, there is no such thing as a, an original concept. You can pull anything from a previous game. Every game that's coming out now, nowadays is inspired by another game. I, mm. I mean, every movie that comes out nowadays is inspired by another movie. To me, this kind of endless kind of back and forth about like, well, this this person stole this from somebody else. It's it's pointless to me, especially because Campbell announced originally that this was already inspired by, uh, by, by that game. So if he already says it, says, listen, this is an homage to this game that I really like, and he brought it to the community of that game, I don't see where their accusations are coming from. But yeah. um, it's a shame because as an indie creator, all, when you're an indie creator, all you're doing is making homages to the games that you liked before. Hmm. Um, and where is the room to allow indie creators to be able to make the homages to the games that they had? I just bought a thing on Itch.io. It's like a 10 pack of PlayStation 1 inspired horror games. Uh, and they're all inspired by the play <laughs> PlayStation 1's fantastic horror uh, games, but they're new. Um, and that's that to me is exciting. I, I don't know. It, this was kind of a bummer. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, everybody. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's it's perfectly reasonable. Like, so this is. I think this is more of a bigger understanding of like, uh, like a lot of times uh, when we deal with a lot of board games and a lot of like like very indie like RPGs. A lot of times, yeah, there are a lot of games that we go ahead and say, oh yeah, this isn't this game that is very much like you know, uh, this other game, but, but it is an homage. And, and a lot of times, a lot of the communities, especially if they're not wrapped in a, like a very, very, like, like their personality isn't wrapped within this individual game, they understand. And they, they like, oh yeah, we like it. You were, you were stating the fact and you're not hiding that you are using this as an inspiration. A lot of, like a lot of people in the community will love it. I think it's more or less is that you can get this obsessive community mm -hmm. that wraps their whole entire personality who they are and such around a particular ip and then they get highly defensive mm -hmm. um about it and it, it might not be what the creator of the game wants but they, they took they take it upon themselves to create this wall and barrier that nothing can be similar to this game and such is, is more of something that we should address is like hey there are like a lot of fandoms that are just like, oh no, I love that. This is like kind of like a Discworld inspired game or X, Y, Z, you know? Mm -hmm. And people were like, <laughs> eat it up. Uh, but there are some of those, like we have to recognize there are some communities out there that just, you know, kind of gatekeep in many ways. Yeah. I mean, yeah, the way too. I figure it, we live in a world where a fanfic of Twilight made millions of dollars. It's time to grow up. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Oh, and you're that's, right. And put a button on that. That's, <laughs> yes. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> um. Well, I have some good news. Maybe. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. No. No button. No. 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 Okay. All right. So hold on. We need to take. Hold on. Let's all take a, a second for a minute. <sighs> 
because we, we just had to deal with that. People got tired real quick for a second. Our button was like, mm, pressed. But it's okay, because you know what? Isabella has some news. No, Miss Miss Baby, that was great. That was okay. thank you so much. <laughs> um, I'll take any theme songs I can get. Um uh so uh coming in early April, which uh news to me is next week, uh, which I just <laughs> discovered. Um <laughs> uh the Scott Pilgrim board game is coming out. This is okay. So this is an ongoing thing. If you're not a, a fan of Scott Pilgrim, I read all the Scott Pilgrim stuff when I was in. That was my cat again. It, I did not part. I did not part. Hi, Wacket. She loves the door. You're gonna thing. kill Bonsai over here. Bonsai is thinking. <laughs> I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I swear to. I'm gonna eat this cat. You know. How I'm, did, gonna fo- I'm gonna follow back your day for you. How- it was me. <laughs> I get it. Don't, don't do that. And I'll, and I'll do it again. Don't do that. You don't need to do that. It no, was okay. packet. I put her in baby jail and she's still terrorizing. Anyway. I love this cat. I've never met this cat. I love this cat so much. Oh my God. I wish she would just okay anyway so um uh Scott Pilgrim uh if if you're not familiar with the fandom uh this is like a long-suffering fandom there was a a, the comic books the the movies didn't do well uh the movie when it came out it didn't do well uh the the comic books have kind of gone in and out of popularity um uh there was a video game the video game got shut down before it was there's been the Scott Pilgrim community uh, of which I was huge into uh, in the early 2000s when I had skinny jeans and I was listening to Panic at the Disco. Um, it's it's long suffering and I'm very excited to say that the board game uh, is coming out. There's a There was a Kickstarter in 2019 um, uh, and uh, this uh, came out, it was successful due to the community and uh, which resulted in over two hundred and thirty-three thousand dollars being raised uh, by by uh, backers, uh, and then there was um, uh, criticism that happened after that, and then that got shut down. It's a it's a mess. Um, uh, uh, that was also not a fart. That was the delivery man. Um, it was me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like really going through it. Um, uh, so. <laughs> I got so, you. We gonna make it. <laughs> um, so yes, it's it's um, two to four players. Uh, you have minis that are really cool. Uh, it looks just like the Scott Pilgrim uh, uh, art that you're familiar with, uh, and I feel like this is finally a win for us in the community who just can't seem to catch a break. It seems like Scott Pilgrim fans just keep getting blow after blow, but we're still here still still liking our stuff um and i feel like one of these days we're like the dc fans of of the of the nerd community (laughs) we'll take any small small win (laughs) that we can get and this is a teeny tiny win for us so yeah early april uh it's it's going to be coming out and i'm very excited about that uh it looks um super cute so yeah good for us one for the scott pilgrim fans Yes. And on that note, we left you with a nice, happy, happy, nice little cookie after all all that cookie to look forward to after all of that really, really real news. But it's okay because now that Derek is away, new R is here to play with the bundle boss. Yeah. All right. I was told to be hyped for the bundle, the bundle boss section. <laughs> so I apologize for how extra I'm about to be. But uh, bundle of holding, y'all. Let's go. <laughs> Hyperborea plus adventure pack was good. Ah, currently $10 for core collection for rule books, Re- referee screens, and pre About $26 gets you nine molecules to level you up. Let's 
goals. I'm just imagining the Bears being good while I do this. All right, this Hyperborea Bundle presents this astonishing swordsman and sorcerers of Hyperborea tabletop fantasy role-playing game from Northwind Adventures. The vividly dangerous Edge of the World Hyperborea campaign setting takes inspiration from the sword and sorcery, weird fiction of Robert E. Howard, Clark Ashton Smith, Michael Morcock, not mature enough to say that without chuckling, and many others capturing the spirit of the original D&D and AD&D rule sets, including Thacko. I just made that last part up. I don't know if it's true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, OSR RPG set uh, is in a world that's very similar to Conan, the angry fighter. And that's the bundle. Boss. Thank you very much. I was like, I'm like, the blouse. I get the blouse. I was like, Derek, Derek, Derek is fired. Derek never yeah. takes a lot of energy <laughs> ever. <laughs> It's okay, because we Ugh. we have officially totally kicked out Derek, and now we have uh, uh, joined uh, as a Kickstarter court. We are uh, forming we a unionize. Kickstarter union. This is the Kickstarter <laughs> union now, and uh, and I, we'll I am become Derek. <laughs> <laughs> So now, yes, we are now starting the Kickstarter union, uh, no longer court, and we are going to start that out. Of course, Noir. Yes. So I am very, 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 very excited to tell you all about The Darkest House. Uh, there's about seven days left. Uh, this Kickstarter is going to be over in April, uh, April 2nd, uh, which as Isabella has discovered, is next week. <laughs> <laughs> the Darkest House is a tabletop role-playing game that's been designed from the ground up to be a digital experience. There's not going to be a physical rule book for this game. Uh, it's compatible with games that you're already playing. In fact, it's made specifically for that. And that's because The Darkest House derives its horror from bonds, backstories, ideals, loves, fears, and your existing characters. Uh, it has its very own house system that will allow you to bring characters from other uh, from other se uh, settings and rule sets, like your Powered by the Apocalypse, your Fifth Edition, your Pathfinder, your Pathfinder, and in about five minutes, you'll be able to bring them into the house system and have them go through this this adventure, which is a creepy dark like Stephen King-ish like experience that really plays with their concepts of uh, like abstract ideas like it really messes with it really is it's, it's like uh, it's one of those uh, what, 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 what do we call them like it's like a psychic horror kind of deal mm. that that really puts your hero characters through the ringer. You're not going to be able to fireball your way out of these situations. These are situations that are prompts for role-playing experiences. Uh, and that really, I, I think that's going to be something that's really cool. I, for one, can't wait to have some of my Powered by the Apocalypse characters meet and play with my fifth edition characters. Uh, and if you want to get started on taking a look at that, of course, you could go over to the Kickstarter uh, and support them that way. But they also have a demo out right now. So you can get a few of the rooms already uh, and see what you're in for. Now, unfortunately, the house system is not part of that demo. So you're not going to be able to bring your characters over. That's something that you're going to get when you take part in the Kickstarter. But this is going to be something that I think is going to be extremely cool. And it works with all of your favorite virtual tabletops. So if you're a Roll20 person like myself, this is going to work perfect for you. If you're a Foundry, that works for you as well. But this entire system has been built for a digital online experience. And it's going to be something else. Yeah, so that's uh, that's what I have of the darkest house. Mainly, I'm just looking forward to scaring the absolute pants off of my players. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> now, I I do have uh, another Kickstarter here that I'm excited about in conjunction with the darkest house, and that's going to be Pixels, the electric dice. Um, they're perfectly smooth, just like regular dice, except like like gamers do, you got LEDs in them and they're programmable. 
Uh, there's a companion app that comes with the Pixels uh, electric dice. So you can set up, let's say, a sound when you roll a one or a sound when you roll a 20. So if you're like me, obviously you're going to have the Price is Right fail horn when you roll a one. And you're going to have like, I don't know, uh, two chains ad libs when you roll a 20 because I get hyped. Um, also, something else that I love about Pixels is that they're already working with all of your favorite VTTs uh, to be ready once they go live. So that means that you'll be able to use these dice with Roll20, with, uh, with uh, D&D Beyond. Uh, one, of, one of my favorite things about playing uh, is, you know, how... D, D Beyond and Roll20 do, does all the math for me. One of my least favorite things is I feel like those systems have it out for me. So being <laughs> able to have click clacks that I can physically blame is going to be good and bad. Um, the other cool thing about these bad boys is that they're wirelessly chargeable. So you just put them in their case, make sure that the highest number is up, uh, up, up facing, and they'll charge right away and you'll be able to tell on your phone or your computer using Bluetooth just how charged they are. Again, these are going to be fantastic. And you know what, a salad, you're right. I might make the one a quack uh, mm. just because, you know, I like ducks and I don't like one. So maybe that duck will make me feel a little bit better. But those are my, oh my two gosh. Kickstarters that I'm watching out for. Uh, you can play the, you can play the Darkest House using your pixel dice and uh, scare the crap out of yourself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, now now you just need to uh, combine that with a rave RPG and just have those glowing dice. All right, time to rave. And you yeah, can okay, change right. the colors of everything. It's dope. Oh gosh. Yeah. No. Yeah. Okay. Back. Now, <laughs> now, now on the list uh, the, for the Kickstarter that I wanted to bring up today is uh, they missed a very great chance to do Hojo Pojo, the awesomely delicious uh, hot pot theme gay card game that makes you go blah 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 blah. blah. Um, with with that, of course, if you guys, it's a JoJo reference. Anywho, it's an easy to learn hot pot uh, theme board game for uh, two to six players. This is very much like a party game. If you want to go ahead and get it with your friends, and also want something that is very deliciously foom themed. Like I'm not gonna lie, uh, when they said hot pot, and the whole idea is that you're competing to uh, may eat eat certain things, eat certain. Uh, ingredients uh before your sauce runs out is very very uh very very thematic towards hot pot in in, in my opinion uh so it's a short five, 15 to 30 minute game like i said designed to two to six players uh it simulates cooking and eating a hot pot with your friends uh you're trying to match ingredients and cook them and then use utensils before of course the base of the soup uh runs out it's a very uh, simple game, fairly light strategy, uh, like late strategy game. It just really invokes that like party style, kind of like almost like you ever remember playing like the Mario kind of like party games. And then you would like everyone would think that they would win. And then at the end, of course, at the end of the course, they'll be like, oh, now we're going to give rewards uh, to people for certain themes. And then you're like, how dare you? So this is probably going to ruin some friendships, but that's OK. <laughs> that's the name of the game. All right. Uh so it's a simple game. And for people who just like hot pot, uh, like me, I love hot pot. It's great, uh, especially Szechuan hot pot. Mm, I like the spices that burn in and out uh, as, as it goes through your body. Uh, but yeah, that has two days left. Uh, Hojo Pojo, the awesome, mm. delicious <laughs> hot pot themed uh, card game. Get it for yourself. Wait, do your Jojo thing again. Oh, the Hojo Pojo. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I'm gonna send you guys the gif of what Bot Sai is. Wait, does not doing. anybody, everyone know that reference? I feel like it's a very big reference. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> moving on. <laughs> Next up, we have 2020, 2022 Quest Calendar, an adventure a day RPG with three days left ending March 30th. Uh, it's a role-playing calendar taking you on a journey with a quest a day in 2022. Playtime is one to three minutes per day. What excited me about this game 
is uh, I've had this idea in my head for a long time of a slow time strategy game instead of real time strategy or turn based strategy. It's this uh, kind of strategy you play out over a number of days. The one of the business card games we talked about was kind of like this as well. Uh, so yeah, I've been dis discussing this with my husband about how do we make this thing that you interact with every day. And we both thought the calendar thing was super clever. Uh, in the beginning of the calendar, you're gonna choose a character to play for the remainder of the journey. It's a solo adventure, but if you have multiple people in your house, you can play it together or you can have multiple and have characters playing in parallel. Uh, so you're just going to be going through the pages of it and doing a little bit in it every day. It's going to last for an entire year. So I just think this is an incredibly clever game design. I'm excited to see how it feels, how it plays. So if all that sounds cool to you, you should check out the 2022 Quest Calendar and play your RPG solo for an entire year every day. Sounds fun. Yay. Ooh. Um, I have two more uh, Kickstarters that I thought were really cool. This one is called So You've Been Eaten. Uh, <laughs> with three days left ending on March uh, 30th. And this is a game uh, basically where you play a, uh, you could play either a beast or you could play a miner. And you're a miner who's been eaten. You've been eaten by a beast. And you basically have to, you could play either as the beast who's eaten or as a miner who has been eaten. Um, and you either have to figure out once you're inside of the guts of the beast, how you're going to be getting out of the game, or you play as a beast who has to figure out how to digest this person faster and quicker. Uh, it's an asymmetrical game. So you two are kind of playing so that uh, one player will have to try to outsmart and make difficult choices for the other player, or you can play against the game as well. This looked really cute. It's very fun. Uh, there is a video game of what the name of it is? That's a great question because I forgot it. Um, that reminded me a lot of this game. Uh, and I'm very, uh, this looks really, really cute. Uh, and I like the idea that you uh, get to try to play to increase um, your health and your bacteria that's in your gut because healthy bacteria equals good, good health overall. And now I have another game that uh, is completely different from this. This one is called Fleur... Fleur Proliferous. Yes, I got it. I got it. I got it. With nine days left, ending on April 5th. And this game is a flower arrangement game. Um, I loved the idea of this. I'm very surprised that Emma did not take this away from me because it's such an Emma game. <laughs> it's <so laughs> it is very pretty. <laughs> it's very pretty. And it's a game where you are taking a stroll through a garden and you're trying to put together the different kinds of flowers um, uh, that uh, will make a beautiful arrangement. And so you can pick flowers. Uh, you can also uh, pick different kinds of um, statues and different kinds of things. And then you can also do different sorts of things like bees. You can, you can get different animals that will kind of like help you uh, to make a more beautiful arrangement. And by the end of it, you're just trying to win uh, whoever has the most uh, um, attractive and beautiful arrangement. I, I think that this is a really great game because of the fact that like, we just need to relax right now. We just, everybody relax. This is not a competitive game. You're, everybody's a winner at the end of this because we all get to look at beautiful art. Um, and this is just a game where like at the end of it, honestly, I really wanted to, to buy this game because I think that my grandmother would actually really like this game. Uh, uh, my Nana loves board games uh, and I feel like this is just a nice relaxing game that I could play with Nana um, after she yells at the television. Um, so yeah, <laughs> um, <laughs> this game is for one to four players and it's called Fluoriferous. It's by the creators of another game that I thought was really uh, nice, which is called Herbaceous and Sunset Over Water, which is also kind of chill games. It relax you. Um, so yes, uh, and if you pledge early, then you get the uh, mini expansion for free. So yeah, buy that, relax, take care of yourself, drink some water, um, and plant some flowers for the bees. That's it. For the bees. <laughs> for the bees. And then yeah. with that note, see, look at that. Isabella coming in with the cleanser. This whole stream. Cleanser, mm -hmm. Isabella the cleansy. But yes, all right, folks. But hey, stick around really quick because we're going to have a five minute break and we're going to switch over because uh, Isabella and Noir are going to be interviewing Nerd Burger Games. Nom, nom, nom. We're going to take a bite out of this Nerd Burger Games and tell you all about that really cool stuff about it. Uh, uh, 
Craig Campbell, Chris, sorry, Craig Campbell is coming in about capers, and I think you guys are going to enjoy it. So uh, we're going to just give us a five minute break, really quick, and we're going to suddenly get sucked into different dimensions and different portals, of course. And just hold on tight, folks. Five. And hello, everybody, and we're back with Craig Campbell to discuss all things capers, and I am very very excited to get this underway i I'm, this is so my style it's not even funny so <laughs> we should start with the basics hi how are you how you doing today i'm good how are you how are, how are both of you good good we, we talked about this um before and noir and i had talked about it we gushed about how much we love uh the the game and how excited we are to buy fancy cosplay and Three smoke piece cigars. <laughs> cigars, the hat, the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> Flapper dresses, gangster suits, Tommy guns. Oh, the, Good stuff. The whole shebang. <laughs> um, but <laughs> before we get too deep into nerding out, which we will do, uh, we should ask you a few questions about yourself. Sure. Uh, how long have you been playing and GMing and doing all of the TTRPG stuff? Oh boy, I've been playing and GMing for 30 years. Um, started in D&D and then kind of rolled into all sorts of other games. Um, you know, dipped my toe for an extended period in uh, the storyteller games, Vampire and, and uh, Mage and Changeling. Um, and then just kind of, you know, it bounced around to a lot of things. It's, it's kind of D&D has been there a lot. But I've jumped into other things. My favorite game of all time is Deadlands. I ran um, a lot of Deadlands um, when that first came out. Um, I started designing, um, like, in, in a professional sense, that is to say, like, actual assignments and, and publishing things here and there, um, like, 20 years ago. But it was real spotty, um, just kind of a little something here and there. And then it was really about seven or eight years ago that my freelancing really kicked up. I did a lot of writing um, and design work for um, D uh, D during fourth edition with the mm -hmm. uh, online magazines. And then about uh, five years ago, I started into like deciding, Hey, I'm a sucker. I'll design my own game. Can't be that hard. <laughs> right. And uh, started designing games and uh, created Nerdburger games and have been doing that. That's been, I, I freelance occasionally here and there, but mostly it's Nerdburger stuff. So I, I have, I have got to ask what goes into making that choice, the choice to, I'm going to make a whole game because that's, that's <laughs> a lot, man. <laughs> well, it was basically I had freelanced a lot for D and D and and a smattering of other um, companies and games, and then if you recall, like kind of toward the end of fourth edition D and D, um, their product schedule slowed out. Like they stopped doing crunchy books. They, it was a lot of uh, kind of flavorful um, lore books, and their uh, magazine schedule kind of changed focus quite a bit. And they weren't bringing freelance stuff into the magazines as much. So suddenly, I my, like all my freelancing that I loved doing. Um, wasn't really there anymore so i had like i can i could do one of three things i could wait wait it out and wait for the new edition to come um i could seek out other games and kind of bolster and and, and fill in with other stuff or i could decide to you know just just give it a shot and design my own game so i gave it a shot heck yeah I, I mean, here we are <laughs> so, so in in the how many other games have you actually done with nerdburger is this oh one of the crap um <laughs> Okay, so in order, there's there's murders and acquisitions, capers, three three full supplements for that, a whole bunch of other accessories and supplements and things, die laughing, which is a small a smaller scale game, um, good strong hands, which is printing right now, and will publish soon, and then I did two zine games for Zine Quest three here this past uh, February, one of which is out called low stakes and one of which is just about ready to go out i've just got to get a proof copy and make sure it looks good okay um, you so the ground running what, what is that like nine or ten or... <laughs> good, good i God. mean that's awesome no, including, I mean, like, including supplements yeah <laughs> that's really like for for only starting it up five years ago that is really incredible like 
that you, since you already had so much of a background in doing uh, freelance work, it sounds like you had a lot of the skills to start doing it. And it seems like it's a natural kind of progression as a fan to move into somebody who wants to start producing things. And it, it involves moving from not just being a designer to, but to also being a developer and a publisher. And, um, you know, I had the whole process of doing the first game, which took a long time. Um, I, I spent a long time developing it uh, because I was, I wasn't on a schedule. Like I had, like, it was, it was all for fun. I was just doing it in my free time. And so as I went along, I learned all the other things where I like, okay, now I have to learn how to talk to a graphic designer and try to get a, a nice game, you know, title logo done. And I need to do, uh, be, become an art director and convey my uh, world to an artist and, um, and learn how to, you know, put, put together a website and, uh, you know, and put together all the stuff for, to publish on drive through RPG and create PDFs and all that stuff. So there's a lot of hats, but it was, I was able to do it just kind of little pieces at a time. It wasn't like I suddenly like <laughs> spent a, a hard down month and became a publisher. So I've got to ask, what was the most frustrating hat to put on? What was the hat that you're like, screw this hat. I'm never oh, wearing this hat again if I don't have to. Boy. <laughs> Um, the hardest one to kind of learn, I, for me, I thought I felt like was um, learning how to art direct, um, because I have a hard time like conceptualizing and putting into words and, and kind of conveying my process and how I develop something and everything. Like I sometimes have difficulty with that, and so now I'm talking to an artist who is like a magician. Artists are wizards, as far as I'm concerned. When I see when I see people post their time lapse of like making this beautiful piece of art, I'm like, that is that might as well be wizardry. Yeah. Um, because and so, but conveying like, okay, I want to convey this, this, and this, and the artwork, give them enough information to develop something, but not so much that I'm stymieing their creativity and restricting them. And I want you know, I want the artists to feel invested in the game world and have them bring their vision to it. Um, so it took a it took a bit of work, I think, in the first few projects to figure out that balance. Um, and that was that was something that it was it was difficult for me because I'd never done it before, and it was it was worrisome that I was doing it well. And I, I was constantly looking for validation with artists later after I developed relationships, and I would say like, "Am I providing you with like enough information and not too much?" And <laughs> That's really good though. I mean, and I love the art direction that's in Capers. Like I love, it's, it's I love so the drawings. Good. It's really, really good. It paints a really good portrait of the world that you're trying to build, uh, which I think is really cool. And one of the things that I absolutely love in this book, um, and you talk about it in your background, is that there's more information about like movies that you can check out. Uh, and there's like a shorthand uh, for different kinds of slang that you can use. Um, and one of the things in your background uh, is that you're also a fan of horror movies as well, which like, I wanna ask you about, but like maybe later, but, um, <laughs> and so <laughs> I wanted to kind of know about the research um, and what did you delve into? What were some of your inspirations? If there were films uh, that went into developing this book? Well, the initial idea came when I was looking at, I was thinking about like doing a supers game. I wasn't sure what, it, I wanted it to be I didn't want to do a kind of classic silver age or golden age comics there's plenty of game books out there different games that that kind of create that world that kind of a super you know classic capes and cowls primary colors um, but there's a lot of really interesting supers games that do weird twists and things and I thought that's like that's up my alley and I toyed around with a, a, a few different ideas and then I was I was literally watching um, I was doing a rewatch of Boardwalk Empire on HBO yes. and watching Al Capone and thinking about Al Capone historically as being, uh, he was kind of a strong guy, um, really savvy guy, really tough guy. Like he was, uh, he, 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 he could, uh, he could give a beaten and he could take a beaten. Um, and I found myself like, because I was thinking about supers, like, well, what if, what if Al Capone was super tough and really hard to kill? Like, like in, in terms of superpowers. And it just kind of took off from there. And I just started taking historic figures and um, layering superpowers onto them and then creating, um, you know, fictional characters. And I brought in writers to help do some of the cities and, and do some of that research too. 
Yeah, I love that. I mean, like the idea of boardwalk empire, but with superpowers, like oh. it's so much of like the superhero kind of stuff, the media that we get nowadays is so modern day, but to take that and put that into the, the past, I think is like such a cool concept and I really, really love it. So, yeah. So I, 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 I have to ask, everything about this is so thematic from, you know, the section in the book that tells you how to speak the slang of the time through the mechanics that use a card-based system that's like, it makes you feel like a gambler at the table. I have to ask, was there any thought in mind to like actual plays or people like playing this as entertainment to show others? Because this, this so this so perfectly creates the atmosphere that I just reading it and imagining producing a show around it it's it's almost like you were like well here's how you're gonna do that here's how you're gonna do that <laughs> sure I mean I've, we, I've I've done some actual play with it um both via like other people kind of doing stuff um, with the game and and with me jamming and doing it and in some cases um, actually using like playing cards and having people hold up cards and um, and so forth because you know most people own a deck of playing cards somewhere um, and then but I also uh, in conjunction when when capers came out I had uh, somebody who helped me out and developed uh, an entire capers uh, playset for roll 20 with uh, using their their card mechanic and putting the the capers uh card faces and card backs because i did like actual playing cards um, <laughs> um for the game too I, I love the and, and put I that in there the with with yeah. like a with like a poker table um overlay that you can drop your cards onto yeah. um and like i think i think it would be an interesting ap to do if you had really like had the production money to put into it to do it with like everybody at a circular poker table um with actual chips and cards on the table you have to you know like it would that's the dream right it's like a multi-camera heavily edited kind of deal where you've got like you know you're looking at different people from different angles and you're getting to see like people um, because there's a there's a currency in the game called moxie that you can use poker chips to represent and um, that'd be great uh but it, it would be pricey <laughs> to produce something like that oh i mean it, 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 it it's begging to happen somebody's yeah. got to get on it because it's just it's so well-rounded in this it you not, you not only do such an amazing job of having the mechanics play into the themes but there's so much world building in this there's uh, Atlantic City, which is nice, but also Chicago. What's up? So, <laughs> so I'm just, it, it's all very exciting. You know, I, I was just curious if that was on your mind at all when you were defining. <laughs> um, well, the the three big cities that get the, 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 the big write up are Atlantic City, New York, and Chicago. And that kind of came out of Boardwalk Empire. Those were the three yeah. hub cities that the show focused on. So there's a lot. It just made it easy for me, right? And it and each of those cities is kind of different. Like Chicago, there's like it's a war zone. There's different gangs that are fighting with each other. New York is like has a has a hundreds of different um, gangs that are kind of holding this precarious balance of power. Um, and then Atlantic City is like all run by one guy. Um. And so it was, it, it allowed me to generate um, like three different kind of three different settings in the same world. Like you can have like, you know, like you, you can have it where you're just dealing with the one boss. You can have it where there's like all these kind of tenuous uh, relationships between people, or you can have it where it's, it's just Tommy guns and fireballs in the street um, in <laughs> Chicago. <laughs> and then there's, there's like little one page write-ups of a whole bunch of other cities that you can gives you a, 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 a jumping off point if you want to develop that city or a way to just take characters on the road for a bit. Yeah, I thought that was really cool. Um, one of the things that I also thought was really cool is that there's kind of like, there's more of an expansion of the world. Like we know that the 1920s America wasn't the most inclusive environment, but you, um, uh, you really expanded, you put new twists on different characters so that it feels more inclusive for every kind of person to, to kind of join and play this game. And I wanted to know, um, was it intentional on your part? And how do you feel about making those kinds of changes to this world? Well, it's definitely an alternate history sort of game. Um, it runs on the assumption that 
yes, there are different races and genders and uh, sexual orientations and so forth, but the game is in a set in a world where that's less of an issue. Um, and the, the conflict is like what arises out of um, prohibition and um, gambling and uh, alcohol sales and production and so forth. Um, and that's not to say that you couldn't incorporate those kind of real world social issues into your game. The game just doesn't paint you into that corner and, 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 and build itself out that way. Um, and it was very intentional to do that. Um, I mean, I, I did, you know, uh, ethnicity swaps and gender flips and things for some of the, for some of the, uh, for some of the characters, just because I thought it would be fun to kind of give it a different twist. And then there were, um, you know, historic characters that are pulled um, who are not, for example, um, uh, Italian, Irish, and Jewish guys in their twenties and thirties, which is uh, like what a lot of people know prohibition to yeah. be. Um, <laughs> And then so, so some of them are pulled specifically historic characters and then some are just uh, you know, works of fiction to kind of fill out roles that were necessary to uh, kind of make each city interesting. Yeah, and I love that because it's like, you're giving them superpowers. Like we're already on another side of it. <laughs> like we're already in a, a fictional alternative universe. So like, why not also kind of expand it? And I think that that makes it so that people of all different kinds of backgrounds can join the game easier so i yeah. i love it i think it's great. i wanted people to open the book up and and if they read up on some npcs or they see some artwork they're going to see someone that reminds them of them somewhere yeah. in the book i was i mean i was just about to call that out uh shout out to beth marty who did a fantastic job on the illustrations here uh everybody is in this book which is just amazing uh you you can't open a page and, and not see yourself in it. So that's, I, I really did appreciate that. Uh, so I, I would have to say, how would, what, what is your elevator pitch for capers for somebody who's never heard of it before? Like, what's your, what's your, this is why you should play it right now. All right. <laughs> capers is a super powered rpg of gangsters in the roaring 20s it uses a playing card press your luck mechanic rather than dice which turns every cha trait check into a gambling game um you know you can flip more cards and hope to succeed um uh, and succeed better than what the first card flips or you can end up failing um, and uh you know that, that that's that, that's the kind of the core pitch to it all and then and yeah. then you know once when people start asking questions then it's like you know and there's supplements that do this and there's like this is what the world is like and if if i'm in the if i'm, if I'm in the elevator i'm buying i do have to say there are so many powers in this like there are so, <laughs> and there's some weird ones too like honestly. Um, what are some of your what are some of your favorites though greg what are some of your favorite well powers? i love all my babies equally <laughs> um, of course, of course. But I, I am particularly proud of of like from the core book from a, of a power that I know I get a lot of compliments on too because it's just something that you don't see. And there's a power called probability manipulation. Um, it's a power that Lucky Luciano has, um, and you of course can take it for your character. And it's built entirely around manipulating the top of your or someone else's playing card deck. So you can take a look at the card and decide, oh, I like that card. I'm going to leave that there. Oh, I don't like that card. I'm going to, I'm going to discard it. Um, you could, you know, there's, there are different variations of that power that allow you to basically f see whether or not you or someone else is going to be successful in the next thing you attempt. <laughs> that is, that is what I'm talking about. Thank you. There's it. One, the powers are so varied and different. And two, because we're not just using dice, they're represented in such a cool way that it's just like, it feels like somebody's reaching across and touching my deck and cheating. <laughs> but, you know, you can't <laughs> do anything about it. So, uh, do you have plans for more caper supplements? And can we get a sneak? Can we get a sneak? Um, <laughs> I, I, there's, there's two... <laughs> there's... <laughs> There's basically two ideas that are still floating in my head, and I've, I've stepped away from Capers for a while after the initial uh, kind of game line run, um, but they're still in my head. And one is to um, go earlier than the 20s, um, back to like late 1800s, and what, ha what would happen if there were superpowered, kind of this, this street level superpowered people in classic Victorian monster filled England. 
um, nice. or, or like Boston, like let's you know, like do like a U.S. version of it and set it in Boston where you've got like the fall of, you know, like Edgar Allan Poe kind of stuff. Um, so Superpowered um, Edgar Allan Poe, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so the, I, I've, I've toyed around with the idea with that and I really, really want it to be a black and white book. Um, with the whole game line is in color, but that one would be black and white because it's so far in the past that it has to be black and white. Um, and then uh, the game line uh, takes you through supplements that take you into the 40s and the 60s. And they're each kind of their own thing. They give you stuff that you can use in the core game, but they also progress the story and they do some interesting genre things. But they also progress, like I said, they progress the um, kind of what's going on with capers in society. Um, and by the time you get to the sixties, like there's, there's a registration act that's in place. And, and if you're not registered with the government, you're considered a rogue agent. And that's what, that's how you end up with supervillains um, in, in, in the 1960s uh, capers covert uh, supplement. And I've, I've projected that whole sixties to the eighties, to the two thousands, to an alternate 2020s where super powered or super, super smart people have caused technology to advance much more uh, quickly and um, taken it into like the government falls to corruption and there are mega corporations and it becomes supers and cyberpunk. Um, and <laughs> like, like the literal cyberpunk version where now you're playing like criminal super powered characters who are fighting back against an oppressive regime. Um, and mega corporations that are trying to control the the world and weaponize you as a super. Wow. All right, I will be sending you a blank check. Um, <laughs> I'll go ahead and put a down payment on that right now. So that sounds so cool. And that one would, if I did it, it would be like a full book unto itself. Again, it would be big um, compared, you know, relatively speaking, and be as big or bigger than than the core game capers. Um, so I've, I've developed quite a bit of stuff for it. It's, I just, I haven't quite pulled the trigger on it because I know it's going to be expensive to produce sure. um, just because of the size of the thing. So that makes it riskier. So I have to find kind of the right time to do it. And I think the right time is not until we get out of the COVID thing. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. and it, because that tends to tighten up people's wallets a little bit. Um, sure. uh, so I, I we'll see. <laughs> I'm hoping. Well, kind of speaking of the the future, uh, the bright future that we're all we're all gonna get to. It's we're gonna get through this. Um, I just wanted to know about like any places that people can look for your future work or any things that you wanted to talk about uh, that you're that you've worked on before uh, that you would like for people to check out. Um, well, there's a, you can go to drivethroughrpg.com. There's all the games and everything are there. Um, if you want the fancy schmancy version of Capers, that's on the web at my web store because uh, you can't get it in conventions right now, but eventually you will be able to. Um, I'm uh, right now, there's a game called Good Strong Hands that is, it's done, everything laid out. It's in printing. It's like literally being printed now. It should be out in early to mid May. Um, which is my uh, homage to movies like Legend, um, The NeverEnding Story, yes. uh, Labyrinth, okay. um, yeah. set in a fantastical world that is on the brink of destruction by a malevolent force. Um, and <laughs> you are there to save it again because oh. this force comes back and tries to eat the world um, every couple hundred years. And so you're, you're, you're working to save that. So oh my God. those are my favorite movies growing up. So <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, that I, sounds so cool. I like to joke that um, the scene with Artex in the swamp in Never Ending Story affected I was me. Just about the reference affected there. me <laughs> affected me so deeply oh, no. that that just <laughs> <not to> be... <laughs> yeah. I know it, it elicits a reaction from people who have seen the movie. Yeah, <laughs> um, but it it affected me so deeply that I decades later created a game where I can save our text this time. Okay, Aww. I was just about to be like, "Don't you kill my horse, Greg? <laughs> Don't you kill my horse? No, <laughs> save the horse. That okay. sounds awesome. <laughs> Well, I'm really excited about that. <laughs> Thank you so much, Greg, for coming on and talking to us uh, about this. Uh, it was a pleasure to have you. Please come back again uh, to, uh, sure. to join us again uh, for to. your next project. 
um, and uh, listen to my tears as I try to save my horse. Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> Please make it easy. Please make it easy to save the horse. I roll terribly. <laughs> well, we still have some more stuff uh, coming up for you guys after this. Uh, Noir, since you're a special guest of honor, do you want to give us our outro? Absolutely. So everyone, uh, please uh, stick around. Uh, we have uh, coming up, oh, I, actually, so sorry, I skipped ahead there. Uh, but we do have uh, coming up on Monday Disney's Villainous Tournament, uh, night three. Uh, that's going to be at 4 p.m. At 6 p.m., we have board games with the Brothers Murphy on Wednesdays at 1.30. We have The Game Gets Dicey playing Abandon All Artichokes. I, I don't know what that is, but I want to play it. And then Friday at 2 p.m., uh, Table Takes Again. Uh, and Derek will look a lot like himself again. <laughs> uh, please remember to follow and subscribe. Turn on your notifications so that you can see when we are on. And if you miss the show, you can find most of our streams up on YouTube just one day later. Uh, and if you want to connect with other Gen Con fans, check out our official Discord. Uh, thank you all for watching. Uh, thank you all for having me. Thank you, Greg Campbell, uh, for coming and making this dope book. And I just can't wait. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, thank you, Isabella, for like helping me through this because I am stumbling my way through this act. But we almost you got, got it. it. You got it. I'm here. I'm supporting you. We got it. We got it. <laughs> it's the home. It's the home stretch. No, we'll we can see. do it. it. We all can right, do it. All right, all right. Thank you, Emma. Thank you, Bonsai. Thank you, Bella. We're out. <laughs> <laughs>